Let me pray for us here as we come before God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that uh, you are who you are. You created us in your image. You created us to enjoy who you are. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that as we open your word now and as you speak to us, Would you soften our hearts? Would you revive us, our spirits, from from the different uh, turmoils and stresses and pressures that we face? Would you refresh us? But would, would you also restory us in our identities? We're hungry for this. So come, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, this last week, I was listening to the CBC while I was driving around, and an interview came on with a guy who had delivered pizza to an ER waiting room. And uh, he'd been in the ER a uh, previous weekend, and it had been a terrible experience. He was there for hours, he was hungry, he was miserable, and so he decided on this next weekend, he was going to bring pizza to the ER waiting room, and, and uh, as he just wanted to kind of brighten the mood, and as only cheesy goodness will do, uh, brighten it, he did. And there was another guy on the call who was there, and he appreciated it, and it was this nice feel-good story all around until... Uh, The interviewer asked the pizza man, why'd you do this? Now, to be fair, that's a really hard question. What motives lie behind the actions that you do? Well, the guy bet. Uh, He replied, you know, Well, this is just who I am. I I do nice stuff. You know, I do kind stuff to people all the time. The world needs more kind people, and I'm one of them. And so I just love giving pizza to people in ER rooms. And about that time, I had to pull the truck over so that I could be sick. (laughs) Welcome to Fort George Baptist Church. Uh, My name is Dan. I am one of the pastors along with Spencer here, and we are glad that you're with us this morning. Happy New Year to you. Uh, My family was away last week out at our cabin. We had a great time of refreshing and catching colds, and so I'm 90% today, which is why I'm all masked up and only partially contagious, so stay away from me, but uh, that's where I'm at today. Uh, This uh, winter semester, we are going to continue looking at a series that we started uh, in Advent, actually, called The Gospel According to David. There's a lot of David stories in Scripture, and and, uh, in the Advent series, we saw that David is one of these precursors to who Jesus is, and so an incredibly important figure for us to get our minds around. And if you're going to look at David, you need to look at his predecessor, King Saul. And so today we're in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And so if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open that up. Uh, We're going to have it on the screen as well. But would you stand with me uh, and follow along? We're in 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to be picking it up in verse 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I've made Saul king. As he's turned away from me, he's not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry, and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul's gone to Carmel. There he set up a monument in his own honor and turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is all this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What's this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, Well, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They they spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. We totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites, wage war against them until you've wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? 
But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and be seated. So pride is pretty hard to stomach when we see it in other people. When we uh, see someone, meet someone singing their own praises, uh, building monuments in their own honor, uh, we know there's probably more to the story. Something else is going on there. And this is where Saul finds himself in this text. But it wasn't always this way for Saul. Uh, in fact, in the early chapters of 1 Samuel, Saul is this, this great guy. So he's tall and attractive and humble. And something happens, and that's not where we find him here. And instead, what we get in this text is this snapshot into the brokenness of the human soul and the ability that we have, that we all have, to hide the truth from ourselves. We can hide the truth from ourselves. So here we find a man who has deceived himself into thinking that he's following God when, in fact, he's completely following his own evil desires. So, in the previous chapter, God sends Saul on a mission. The Amalekites are neighbors of Israel. They're an exceedingly wicked and warmongering people. And God tells Saul, wipe them out, leave no one alive, not even any animals. It's very, very clear. But instead... Saul decides, you know, I'm going to take the best of the livestock, going to bring them home, and I'm going to take King Agag, I'm going to hold him prisoner, that's what I'm going to do. Now, I'm going to just need to stop there for just a second and acknowledge that God's command to Saul to kill all the Amalekites sounds terrible. And... Uh, We live in a particular time where we are particularly sensitive to this kind of thing. Our culture determines that if someone has done something that doesn't measure up to our standard of the way things are supposed to be, uh, you know, we we cancel them when uh, we don't want to hear from them anymore. But this is actually something called ethnocentric judgmentalism, ethnocentric judgmentalism. It's actually not a new idea. Cancel culture is a new idea, but ethnocentric judgmentalism judgmentalism is is quite old, but it's this idea that our culture is the best culture, and we judge every other culture and every other time period by our own standards, and of course, we would like to judge God by our own standards as well. Ethnocentric judgmentalism. All right, now hold that a little bit in tension. If you can, climb back 3,000 years in order to see what God is doing in this text and with this command. So God says to Saul, I want you to go into battle with these Amalekites, but you're to go to battle for justice, not to get rich or to gain power. Now, you know that when nations go to war, almost everybody claims that they're going to war for justice and truth, right? Right? Everybody says that. I mean, uh, Russia and Ukraine, both sides are saying that. Every war has said this. But here this is God calling Israel to do something for justice. Now, there's another side to that. And, of course, that is that how do you deal with an unjust group of marauding murderers? You need to use force. These kinds of people don't necessarily respond to reason. But God says, here's what God says. I don't want you to use force the way the Amalekites do. So the Amalekites were used to using force to increase their wealth and power. They were going all over the place, uh, uh, raping and pillaging, all sorts of terrible stuff. But God says, Saul, 
you aren't going to profit, not even a cent, from this terrible but necessary act of justice. This is the command that God gives. Now, it doesn't make this an easy text. It's not a warm, fuzzy passage or anything like that. But actually, there's lots of passages that are uneasy in Scripture. But, but this is what happens. But, but here's what happens next. Saul decides, instead of following what God says, he's going to become the Amalekites. That's what's going on in this passage. God calls him to something, a justice. Saul responds by really becoming the Amalekites. And actually, this is exactly what God said would happen when Israel begged for a king. Just a few years earlier... God told them, you know, your king is going to get power hungry. Uh, he's going to lord his position over you. Uh, he's going to lead you away from me. He's going to lead you towards looking exactly like these wicked nations that I've called you to drive out. This is what's going on here with Saul. But what Saul's trapped in here isn't unique to him. This is something that all of us are susceptible to. So here's a guy who is lying to himself and to God. He's convinced himself of how awesome he is, while at the same time committing the exact same crimes that the Amalekites are guilty of. How does this happen? The answer is self-deception. The answer is self-deception. So let's look at the text. Notice how the exchange between Samuel and Saul starts. So God sends uh, Samuel speaks to Samuel. He has a dream and it wakes up in the morning. He tells him, go confront Saul about this disobedience. But Saul's not home when Samuel gets there. Instead, uh, in, in verse 12, it says that he's gone to Carmel and he, he set up a, a monument in his own honor there. And then now he's down in Gilgal. And so Sam, Samuel kind of goes on this journey to find Saul and eventually he finds him. And as he's walking up to Saul, Saul starts talking. Samuel hasn't even said hi yet, and this is what we read. Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I've carried out the Lord's command. What's all this bleeding of sheep and goats and lowing of cattle that I hear, Samuel demanded. It's like when uh, Nikki and I open the door after going shopping, uh, you know, we're out at Superstore or whatever, we come home, we punch in the pin code, and inside we can hear this, you know, dramatic rustle all of a sudden. As we're opening the door, the Nintendo is switching off, and the kids are saying, Hi, Dad! We're glad you're home! We've only been playing Nintendo 10 minutes! <laughs> like, ah. Oh. So Saul knows he hasn't been following God's command. He knows, but he doesn't know. He's convinced himself that he's awesome. The Hebrew here is actually kind of funny. So it says, literally, Saul says like, Hi, Samuel, I listened to the Lord's command. And Samuel replies, If you listen to the Lord's command, why am I listening to all these sheep? The lie is like really thin. But here's the thing with self-deception. No one else has to be tricked by it, but we are remarkably gullible when it comes to our own lies. We're remarkably gullible when it comes to our own lies. From time to time, I talk to couples who are getting divorced. It's way less fun than talking to couples that are getting married, right? With couples that are getting married, it's all, you know, oh, she's so awesome, he's so amazing, right? It's all like that. With couples that are getting divorced, it's, oh, I'm so awesome, and somehow by celestial error, I have ended up married to Hitler. And they both say this. And they don't think they're lying. You look in their eyes. They believe they're true, but for everybody else around, you can see that it's not the whole story. Just as an aside, if the thought of building a great marriage is more appealing than lying to yourself in my office, let's go to the marriage retreat at Nest Lake, okay? Deal? All right, it's worth the money. All right, here's the point. Every action has a motivation that lies behind it. Every action has a motivation that lies behind it. And while our actions, our outward actions are easy to see, our motives can be elusive. 
even to ourselves. But every action, good and bad, has a motive. And so nobody just delivers pizza to random people because they're nice. We all know that. And this is why when somebody's bragging about how good they are, it can make us sick. But here's the thing. It's not wrong that our good actions have motivations behind them. It's not wrong that our good actions are motivated by something. In fact, Jesus wants us to do good things motivated by a desire for reward. He wants us to seek reward. For example, Luke 12, Jesus says this, sell your possessions and give to those in need. That's a good action. Why, Jesus? Why would we ever do that? Jesus says this, this will store up treasure for you in heaven, and your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will also be. So Jesus says, seek my kingdom. Seek my reward. Don't try to be altruistic. Don't, don't trick yourself into thinking you're just a good person. Right? Nobody's good but God alone. So be, become aware of what your motivation is. Shift your motives from seeking earthly rewards, things that aren't going to last, These are things that are going to get eaten by moths and, and stolen. Instead, seek the reward that God wants you to have, something that's going to last forever. Friends, Jesus wants you to get what's actually best for you. Jesus wants that for you. He wants the best for you. And he wants you to be motivated by his love of you to get what's best for you. He wants what's best for you. Okay. That's not actually where the text is going. What we're talking about in this text is what motivates the bad stuff that we do. So why does Saul take home the sheep? Why does he make the Amorite king into a pet? What lurks behind our decisions that, that thing, to, to do things that we know are wrong? All right, hello, some people do some things that they know are wrong. Okay, what lurks behind our decision to do what we know is wrong while at the same time convincing ourselves that we're good? Anybody sees himself in that? It's really quiet in here this morning. Yeah. Happy New Year! <laughs> Tim Keller says, self-deception isn't the most terrible thing we do. But it's the reason we do the most terrible things. Self-deception is not the ter most terrible thing we do, but it's the reason we do the most terrible things. You see, it's possible for us to, to not know something that we actually know. In fact, it's not just possible, it's easy. This is the nature of self Deception. And so Saul is just like pushing through the sheep on his way, and he, he's running out to Samuel with this big smile on his face. I did what God said. And the, the lie detector's going off in his own ears. The emperor's got no clothes, but, but he doesn't want to believe it. And because he doesn't want to believe it, he, he doesn't. And he's so committed to this deception that when Samuel just like points to the sheep that are right there, Saul starts smoke screening. We read this, it's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We destroyed everything else. <laughs> oh, these sheep, right? I I'm not even really sure where they came from. You know what? The army brought them home. Not, not me, right? But since they're here, why don't we sacrifice them uh, to your God? Saul's not just a good guy, he's a religious guy. This is who I am, right? I'm just all about the sacrifices. The world needs more sacrificial people, and I'm one of them. I just love giving God sacrifices. That's what I'm about to do. Right, Saul? It's a smokescreen. It's like uh, the mafia hitman with mom tattooed on his arm, right? He, he might kill people, but he really loves his mom, so he's a good guy. At least he thinks so. Where does this come from? Why do we lie to ourselves about stuff we don't want to be true? 
Why do we shift the blame and say, everybody else's fault, but not my fault? Why do we hide behind some good stuff that we do and think that it justifies the bad? Where does this come from? Well, there's a hint where it came from for Saul in the text. And so in verse 17, Samuel tells Saul, Although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel. Although you may think little of yourself. Saul, you don't think very highly of yourself. Saul's got low self-esteem. Now, what would low self-esteem have to do with sheep and agag? Turns out everything. It's not pop psychology, though. This is a spiritual problem. So get your head around this. Saul is an incredibly successful man. If he's in a room with us, we're impressed, right? He's risen from total obscurity to become the king of the nation. Uh, He's rich, he's handsome, he's powerful. But there's some brokenness in him that even this success doesn't satisfy. Way back in the beginning when Samuel anoints King uh, Saul king, uh, Saul responds this way. But am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? While this may have been humility in the beginning, it festers into insecurity. Isn't it interesting how sometimes the gifts that we have, like humility, can also be tied to the problems that we have? Like your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. Ever notice how that kind of plays out? Here's where this plays with Saul. Saul thinks little of himself. What happens when we think little of ourselves? Well, we need to make, find ways to make ourselves valuable. Everybody needs value. All humanity seeks this. Now, Where does Saul look for value for himself? Well, first he looks to social recognition. So he goes and he builds this monument in his own honor. So people are all going to say, wow, wow, Saul, like big monument, great guy, right? He looks to wealth. He he brings home the best of the livestock from the Amalekites. And he looks to power. He puts this leash on Agag. So now Saul's a king of kings, right? He's got a king on a leash. Instead of obeying God, Saul looks to wealth and power and recognition to build his identity. Now, there's nothing wrong with recognition. Nothing wrong with wealth or or power. But when we look to these places for value, they become our gods. When our gods are involved, this gets tricky. You see, when gods are involved, the ends always justify the means. The end of God always justifies any means. If God tells you to do something, it justifies anything. The ends always justify the means. We'll do anything to know, even things that we know are wrong in order to appease our gods. It's not just Saul. This is, this is us. There's nothing wrong with uh, social media. Uh, Pastor Spencer talked a little bit about social media last week, and Nothing wrong about social media, but when we post uh, pictures, say, of our our awesome vacation, we're seeking likes. I mean, there's something about that when, you know, a whole bunch of people give you that thumbs up. It feels really good, right? There's, There's a social recognition there. And there's nothing wrong to recognition, but when we look there for our value, that's where the problem starts. And, oh, this is a gray and fuzzy line. When we look there for value, it becomes an idol. It's our God. And gods demand our worship. And that's why, if this has become your God, this is what will happen. You'll find yourself spending endless hours posting presentations of yourself that make yourself look better than you actually are. Nobody has that good a time, right? Smile out to here in Hawaii every weekend. Nobody looks that good all the time. 
It's lies. It's deception. Doing something we know is wrong because the ends justify the means. The social recognition is your God. What about money? Nothing wrong with money. But when we look to money to give you value, when we do this, what happens is we start cutting corners and bending rules to get more of it because it's our God. Demands your worship. And with worship, the end always justifies the means. What about the, the games that kids play in school? So two girls will decide who they aren't going to talk to in order to make themselves the queens of the class. Remember that? It's a pursuit of power. Power will make them valuable. Saul's is a 3,000-year-old story that could have been written today. Isn't it amazing how Scripture works like that? People have been seeking value and looking to get it from the gods of money and power and recognition forever. And here's the thing. All gods promise value if we seek them. But the gods lie. You know, there simply is no amount of recognition that will give you the value that you seek. Movie stars kill themselves. There's no amount of money, there's no position high enough, not prime minister, not king, that's going to satisfy this vacuum for value in your heart. But there is one God who says that you're valuable because you were created in his image. It's the only fountain deep enough to satisfy your thirst. Only when we find our value in who God says we are, will we actually have a correct view of ourselves. Only when we take as true what God says about us can we avoid self-deception. Here's another way of thinking of this. Saul has a lower view of himself than God has of him. Right? God chose Saul. God thinks of Saul as a king. He anoints him. But Saul disagrees. He thinks little of himself. But when we disagree with God about who we are, one of us is wrong. Happens actually all over scripture. This is a very common theme. So God calls us to become who he intends us to be and we can't see it. Take Moses as an example. There's lots of examples. Moses is one. He's at the burning bush. God tells him, I got some children, right? They're stuck in slavery. I've chosen you to be the champion. Moses says, you got the wrong guy, right? Like, I've got no credentials. I've been out here herding sheep for 40 years. I murdered a guy. You didn't notice that? I got no credentials whatsoever. I can't even talk good. If you think I'm the guy, you must be really low on options. Moses and God have different ideas about who Moses is. Guess what? One of them is wrong. And if you read the story, you find out it's Moses, right? Spoiler alert. I hope that didn't wreck it for anybody. Huh? It's Moses. Moses turns out to be a great leader of the people of Israel. It's almost like God had a better idea of who Moses was than Moses did. Guess what? God has a better grasp on who you are than you have on yourself. Hmm. If God has a different idea of your value than you have, one of you is wrong. And until you find your value in who God says you are, you will lie to yourself in pursuit of value with every idol that beckons. That's what happens. When we don't go to God for our value, we got to go somewhere else. That's what happens. Now, if any of this rings true for you, don't feel, uh, feel like I'm signaling you out. Uh, everybody's vulnerable to this. Let me tell you about a friend of mine who suffers from low self-esteem. His friend and I were quite close. I know him well. He cares way too much what people think about him. Often, 
social recognition plays more of a role in his life than God's recognition. And so he tries to master every area of his life, his, his health, his finances, his family, in order to prove to himself, to everybody else, that he's a valuable person. But don't worry, he talked to a counselor last Thursday, and he's good now, all right? It's all good. He looks just as good as he looks this morning. Right? Why? What do we do about this? How do we shift the source of our value from idols to the God who made us and endows us with value? How do we do that? Friends, we need to see Jesus. We need to see him and we need to see how he sees us. Let me tell you about who Jesus chooses. Everyone Jesus chooses is someone who has value to Jesus. Does that make sense? Do you believe that? Do you think maybe Jesus made a mistake with you? Friends, Jesus sees value differently than we do, and Jesus is right! Jesus chooses guys like Peter, an impulsive fisherman. Speaks first, thinks later. I like him. But Jesus thinks he's got value. Jesus wants Peter on his team. Jesus wants you. It's not an accident that you're here. It's not an accident that your heart responds to Jesus' call. He wants you. He's calling you to himself. And Jesus doesn't want us because of some skill or ability that we're going to bring to the table. He's not looking to bolster his strength with our assets. He wants us on his team for his glory and for our good. He designed the world actually in such a way that these things work together. Here's how. We've talked about this before, but before time existed, God existed in perfect community with himself, Father, Son, and Spirit. He was not lonely. He was not bored. He was perfectly happy forever. And out of this happiness, he decides to create, and he creates to increase his glory. But how? How can an infinitely glorious being increase his glory? The only way is to invite other beings into his presence to share in his joy, the joy that he has with himself. And when we see him and and enjoy him and center our lives around him and his glory, his glory gets increased. So glory is the acknowledgement of greatness. And so Jesus is looking for people who realize that he's this amazing and great God who loves me. He's looking for people who realize that and then would respond by loving him in return. But there's more. God creates humanity in such a way that when we find our value in who he is, when we center ourselves around him, we're actually not swept away into nothingness. That's a Buddhist idea. That's not a Christian idea. Instead, we become ourselves when we center ourselves around Christ. This is what Jesus wants. He wants Christ-likeness for us. He wants you to grow to look more like Jesus because he knows that the closer we image him, the more we are who we really are. So when Jesus chose Peter the fisherman, he doesn't discard his passion. He doesn't discard his skill set. He actually perfects it. He called Peter to become this fisher of men. When we come to Jesus, we don't, just, we don't just become more like him. We actually become more like ourselves. We, the more we look like Jesus, the more human we become. God created humans in his image. Our value is revealed for what it is the closer we come to our creator. Friends, feast your eyes on Jesus Are you feasting your eyes on Jesus? Are you growing and pursuing Jesus? Are you spending time growing to increase your likeness of Jesus? 
Feast your eyes on him. Though he's great, he became small. This is Philippians chapter 2. He's the image of God, but he empties himself to become a servant and dies on the cross. And in this moment of dying on the cross, he, he actually becomes small in God's eyes so that you could become great in God's eyes. Jesus lived and died in your place so that when you say, Father, forgive me because of what Jesus has done, you actually step into what he created you for in the beginning. You're closer to who you really are. You're a child of the king. This is who we are. God chose you. It's not an accident. You're not like the default. He's not like, oh, man, well, I, I got extra seats on the bus, I guess. He chose you. You're a child of the king. This is what God, the God of the universe, thinks of you. And know this, if your heart is pricked by this and you see how much he loves you, it's because his spirit is in you. He's calling you to himself. So respond. Respond to that. Let his love of you motivate you to live for his glory. Throw off these idols that lie to you. And seek his kingdom and his righteousness, his reward. This is who you're created to be. This is who you are. Amen? Amen. We're going to go right into communion now. Communion is for people who recognize that we're children of the king. you gotta, you got to know that you're a child of the king to come to Jesus' table. But that's the only criteria. That's it. We come as children of the king because he makes us that. Mm. And we, when we take this as well, what we're also saying is we want to grow in Christ-likeness. We want to become who he wants us to be. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's participate together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, you are the God of glory and happiness. You existed in perfection for eternity and then created out of that perfection and happiness because you wanted to invite us into it. You created us with that potential, with that identity. We are beings that can enjoy the glory of God. And we broke that, sin broke that, Jesus. And so you stepped down into our place. You crossed the infinite gap that separated us because you knew that we couldn't cross it on our own. You crossed it for us to bring us back to what you created us for in the very beginning. You love us. You think we're valuable. You like us. You like me. Jesus, you're worthy of our worship. You're worthy of us finding our value in you. Help us. We live in a land saturated with idols. Everything cries out for our attention and worship. Everything tells us that if we get this or that, then we'll be valuable. And we buy the lie and we lie to ourselves. Thank you, Jesus, that you cut through the lies 
to meet us where we are, to take us to where we were created to be. Help us to live restoried by this, this week. In the name of Jesus, we pray.